everyone, and welcome to episode 101 of the podcast uh, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. So, in July 1941, a German scientific expedition set out from the city of Thessaloniki to head to Mount Athos, which is the quasi autonomous monastic federation in the north of Greece. And while there, they spent a lot of time. Uh, documenting uh, medieval antiquities, photographing manuscripts and uh, liturgical vessels and the life of the monks and the landscape of the uh, beautiful mountain on which the uh, monasteries are situated. This expedition was headed by Franz Dulger, who was professor of Byzantine studies at Munich and one of the uh, great Byzantinists of the 20th century. And it resulted in the publication of, I mean, among other things, um, a volume, uh, which I'm holding uh, right here in my hands, called Munchland Athos, uh, yeah, Monkland Athos, which um, has a number of uh, f- plates, sort of images, um, photographs taken by the scientific expedition with accompanying text and scholarly apparatus. And Dolger was an expert also in the um, edition and publication of like official documents um, issued by Byzantine institutions, both monastic, ecclesiastical, um, and and secular. And he gained access to many of those um, from his stay there. Now, these were obviously not normal times. In 1941, Greece was <laughs> under uh, German military occupation, and Dolger had uh, maneuvered himself within the Um, uh, institutional apparatus of the Nazi state to gain uh, access uh, to Athos and secure backing of uh, both the bureaucracy and military forces in case they were needed. Um, And this research was carried out under the conditions of pretty frank military occupation, which you can even see in some of the photos. Athos was, and in some ways still is, kind of notorious for being difficult to access, for gaining permission to do things there, and, um, you know, Dulger used the uh, situation of the time to his advantage. The very last plate in the book is an icon of Chancellor Hitler uh, painted by the monks there, and Uh, Clearly, uh, his choice to conclude the volume in that way as a kind of tribute to the national leader who was at the time believed to be uh, taking Germany uh, to a new imperial height. Now, Dulger was not himself a fervent Nazi, um, from what I've read of his works. First of all, he's a first-rate scholar um, in the technical work that he did. Uh, However, um, he was like very many academics who were perfectly happy to go along uh, with the, you know, times and take advantage of the opportunities that were available to them, uh, despite the highly questionable, um, you know, decisions that had been made that opened those opportunities um, up for him, to put it mildly. Uh, and he was willing to signal his, his sort of indirect support for the regime that had benefited him in some of his articles, for example, he opens with some grand proclamations about how certain great men periodically renew the vigor of Roman, kind of Italian and German, um, you know, greatness, uh, which is a very clear allusion to Mussolini and Hitler. That in an article that he wrote on the um, idea of Rome in Byzantine thought. Now, this kind of behavior one wants to hope would be condemned very quickly and powerfully today. These are, again, to put it mildly, not the parameters of ethical research. And yet, even after the war, Dolga remained a leading light in the field, uh, institutionally powerful, well-connected, very respected, to my knowledge, now I haven't researched his biography very closely, but to my knowledge, no shadow was cast on uh, his research or his integrity um, because of this. In fact, it's hardly ever mentioned in the field. 
uh, which continued to talk about its great figures in very hagiographical terms until into the 21st century. It's really only now that we're beginning to reckon with the dark side of the history of our discipline. Um, and if you want to read more about this, I will refer you to Veronica de la Dora's uh, beautifully written uh, book on imagining Mount Athos, uh, but also a um, recent article by Panayotis Agapitos on Franz Dolger in the 2019 issue of Byzantine Zeitschrift. So I'm going to pull out a couple of threads from that story that are relevant for the uh, interview discussion that you're about to hear. First of all, it illustrates how more powerful countries in the context of overt empire building, that is military conquest of other countries, countries have advanced the scientific agenda of the uh, professors and scholars at their research institutes. So in this case, a professor at the University of Munich benefits directly from German empire in Greece. This is a recurring theme in the history of many disciplines, especially classical studies and archaeology. Uh, but Byzantine studies um, is not uh, immune to it. Uh, there are a number of excavations, for example, that have taken place under the context of you know, Russian occupation of part of the Caucasus, Greek occupation, part of you know, uh, Asia Minor, Turkey, and so forth. And the second theme that I will pull out is the degree to which say, like people on the ground, in this case, let's take the uh, monks on Mount Athos, um, who are subjected to certain, you know, conditions in order for a scientific discipline, in this case Byzantine studies, to advance its research agenda. Now, the situation of the monks was fairly complex. Presumably those who painted the icon of Hitler um, were not entirely unsympathetic uh, there's some evidence that some of them saw him as a great uh, champion and defender um, of whatever Europe or Christendom against the Bolshevik threat, the you know Soviet Union, which they probably at the time regarded as a worse threat to their religion than the Nazis. Even though at the same time there were other monks who were um, hiding um, allied operatives in Greece in sometimes the very basements of the monasteries, uh, where German uh, troops were supposed to be maintaining the Nazi order. Okay, it's a complex picture, but we see how a scientific discipline here creates you know, difficult facts uh, for people on the ground. And if we want to think more broadly about how disciplines are implicated in um, historical facts of injustice and inequalities, uh, we need think no further than the inequalities that characterize our own research institutions, some have a lot more money than others, and that money um, often comes from fairly disreputable, you know, historical um, origins. Uh, in, for example, the slave trade. Right? You may think, well, what does modern Byzantine studies have to do with the slave trade? Well, well, these pots of money are not entirely separate, and if you really follow the money, uh, you will sometimes, again, go into some pretty dark places. So a number of fields have at this time begun to critically look at their histories um, and the kinds of entanglements with empire and colonialism um, that um, you know, provided sometimes the funds or the impetus or the ideological framework in which they operated. And that is one of the major goals of the volume that we will be discussing today, uh, which is a volume of papers edited by Benjamin Anderson, um, who is a professor of art history and classics at Cornell University, um, and Mirela Ivanova, uh, former guest of the show, uh, who's a, a lecturer in medieval history at the University of Sheffield in the UK. The volume is called Is Byzantine Studies a Colonialist Discipline Toward a Critical Historiography? Um, it's a it's a it's a slim, uh, it's elegantly produced volume. The papers in it are fairly short. I've contributed one of them, so it's very easy to to read, and you, and they come from very different perspectives. Um, so it's a very convenient way to uh, uh, um, access uh, a number of different perspectives on, on this issue, um, in, including those which 
present Byzantine studies as the the colonized in in certain relationships. So, for example, in its relationship with classics, uh, or in the case of the paper I wrote, the the kind of idea of Europe, the kind of hegemonic idea of Western Europe as the norm of you know Enlightenment progress and so on. Byzantium and Byzantine studies have often been cast as the negative other that is in many ways colonized by the needs um, of the the more prestigious disciplines, the more prestigious parts of Western Europe um, to project their own uh, superiority. Anyway, like I said, there's a range of perspectives um, in the volume and they're they're very stimulating and um, it's really the first time that um, the discipline is Uh, trying to engage with these kinds of ideas uh, like classics and other fields have been doing it for longer as I said for most of the 20th century and even for our century um, Byzantine studies has tended toward the more hagiographical uh, way of looking at its great figures and the past and so forth anyway that seems to be we seem to be turning a page on that front at least Anyway, I also strongly recommend that you you read the introduction. I believe that it is available um, online as a kind of sampler. Um, I just found it, um, a link to it from uh, Ben's uh, webpage at Cornell, um, and it'll give you a sense of the different kinds of um, ideas that are um, being discussed in the book. Okay, I've gone on long enough. Um, Thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Here is my conversation with Ben and Mirella. Okay, so it's wonderful to have both of you on the podcast. Uh, so, uh, Ben, uh, this is your first time on this podcast, I believe, right? That's correct. And Mirella, welcome back. Thanks for having us. So let's talk a little bit about the oh, the general goal of the book. And first of all, can you tell us what it means in general for an academic discipline to be colonialist? Uh, ben, do you want to start with this? Sure. I think first of this famous essay by the archaeologist Bruce Trigger from 1984, it was published in the journal Man, and it's called Alternative Archaeologies, Nationalist, Colonialist, and Imperialist. And he works through in that article what it means for the discipline of archaeology as an academic discipline to be respectively nationalist, colonialist, or imperialist. Trigger has probably the most obvious example to, uh, or the most obvious um, definition of what it is that makes a discipline colonialist. And that's namely that it is constructed in the service of a settler colonial state. So his textbook example of colonialist archaeology is American archaeology, the way it was practiced by mostly settlers and descendants of settlers studying the indigenous communities of the Americas up until the 70s or so, when this was largely um, an ideologically driven discourse that was constructed to paint the indigenous inhabitants of North America as primitive, as backwards, it's predicated on cultural evolutionism, and is very much serving the ongoing colonization of that um, particular territory. So that would be one obvious example of a a, a colonialist discipline. You could also think um, at one remove of academic initiatives that are funded by wealth that's been extracted by a settler colonial state, um, even if it's not directly serving um, the particular project. So in our volume, there's a really interesting essay by Nathaniel uh, Aschenbrenner and Jake Ransohoff, which is about Hieronymus Wolf and um, the indirect mechanisms by which early Byzantine studies were funded by um, settler colonial states in the Americas, extractivist settler colonial states, the Spanish Habsburg um, rule in Latin America. Uh, that funds Byzantine studies, whereby already there, the the connection between early Byzantine studies and Mm. settler colonialism in the Americas is a little bit more abstract. There's perhaps one level of remove. I think that also, Marilla and I have talked about this at various times, I think that there's also a much looser sense in which this term might be used today, especially in university discourse in the U.S., what would it mean for a, a discipline to be? colonialist. And it might be largely metaphorical 
So a discipline that takes as its common sense um, certain colonialist attitudes or value judgments that's um, predicated on hierarchies that we might call in a more abstract or metaphorical sense colonialist. I think in our volume, we largely avoid that third definition and attempt to establish where, when, and how Byzantine studies in the past or today could be considered colonialist in one of the first two senses of the term that we've just outlined. Okay, uh, Mirella, you want to add something to that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just to pick up this point that Ben made about the slightly more metaphorical use of, of colonialist. Um, one of the debates that perhaps is kind of relevant to Byzantine studies um, and which and which I think sometimes slips into using this kind of slightly loose metaphorical colonialist is the idea that's, that something like the word Byzantine for the East Roman Empire is like a colonialist name, that it was given by a set of normative judgments or values um, in, in, the, in the West in particular, which like idealized the Roman Empire and would distance themselves from the um, medieval Roman Empire. And so came up with this term, which then normalized this otherness. And then this is in so, so, so this is the sort of the slightly looser metaphorical and um, metaphorical use. But yeah, as, as, as Ben said, I think uh, we tried as much as possible to, um, to think more in, in the other, in the other two ways about the ways in which our discipline has or has not kind of produced the cultural hegemonies of, of, of colonialist norms rather than you know whether or not the middle ages for example is a is a colonialist term when right. it's used for medieval china or something like this you know um, right yeah and within that spectrum that you outlined um, i mean i can think of a number of uh, you know d different variations for example just a sheer practice of classical archaeology in many of the classical lands, I mean, as someone who grew up in Greece, you, you can, it's easy to experience the foreign schools sometimes as coming in and having these attitudes, like there's no like de facto legal colonial situation here. Quite the contrary, the laws have been rewritten to favor the host countries in most instances, but the attitudes are incredible. Um, like just the way they treat local labor forces and like, this is our history that we're excavating in your country, <laughs> right? This sort of thing. And it's kind of replicated fractally within the discipline in the sense that um, like Byzantine remains are treated by classical archaeologists as a kind of lesser thing to get to be gotten through rather than as a goal of research. Um, so anyway, th th there are a lot of variations of, on, on this theme, and I think a lot of them come out in the volume. Um, can I ask, how did your collaboration start? Like, how did you two come together and decide to to produce a book like this? Um, Mirella, you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was sort of the summer of 2020 is kind of key here. And there were two events, I think, which kind of by accident occasioned our collaboration. Um, the first was this, this, you know, huge eruption after the death of George Floyd um, of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which manifested itself in the cultural sphere, in particular in, in, in academic and museum institutions, as a kind of moment to pause and reflect on what it means to be colonialist or what it means to decolonize. That, that's kind of one refraction of it. I mean, obviously, it was also a grassroots political movement in the United States, which had like much more and concrete political agendas on the, on the streets and in, in American legislature. But I think globally what it became is this moment of reflection um, for cultural institutions um, and a moment to kind of pause and think, OK, what is the what's my duty as a kind of global political citizen and, and what is my discipline kind of or institution um, sitting on? Where has it come from? Where has its wealth come from? And then what are we doing with that with that wealth? And so that was the kind of principal thing in a, in, a, in a way which united us and um, Ben at the time was the president of the uh, Byzantine Association of North Americanists and they issued a kind of call um, to think about decolonization and um, but in in the sort of in the interesting way that like uh, uh, American events tend to become um, uh, the global chronology of things and um, I was part of a network in Oxford which had the previous year already had an event about uh, whether like colonialism and imperialism in Byzantine studies and, and whether the Byzantine Empire could be colonial or colonialist. And so we so I sort of reached out and I said, well, we've started doing this work. Um, and that 
led to a webinar, but, the, but then the webinar, but by the time we had the webinar, this other sort of event had happened and, and Ben had issued this call through um, the Byzantine Association of North Americanists saying, you know, is Byzantine studies a colonialist discipline? Like, let's open a conversation and had quite muted response. I mean, there was some sympathy and people were interested in the question, but on balance, I think people were quite sceptical of the idea that Byzantine studies was political in the same way that like Black Lives Matter was kind of occasioning. Um, and that hesitancy um, that, that kind of marked this one particular moment of reflection was quickly lost when the Turkish state announced that it would convert the Hagia Sophia into a mosque, and which, which funnily enough happened sort of within a week of the death of George Floyd. So two, mm. two uh, um, unrelated but, but simultaneous events. And so suddenly our discipline became extraordinarily political. Everyone had a, a, you know, a letter to write to the president of Turkey and national, um, national committees of Byzantine studies, which had basically laid politically dormant for decades and done nothing but organized conferences, were suddenly issuing open calls and public political statements to their presidents and, and others. Um, so it seemed like a good moment for us to, to pause and think, okay, well, why is it that uh, we, we have a discipline which doesn't respond to a call um, to decolonize on the back of kind of racialized violence in the United States, but which kind of calls for a greater consideration of our practices, but does respond to an action by um, a nation state to um, to change um, to, to, to sort of transfer a historical monument, and and what does that say about this? So we thought that was a good a good kind of moment to reflect on these um, on what Byzantine studies stands for, I guess, and what it is that we're trying to achieve um, achieve through it. Um, I don't know, if Ben. Ben, do you have anything to anything to add? No, I mean, it, the other aspect of this that was very twenty twenty is that it all played out over Zoom. Um, and uh, from our initial meetings with um, some folks from Basana um, and some folks from the Oxford network, that was all on Zoom. Then the webinar, um, which really is the immediate origin of the volume, was a very elaborate Zoom event um, mm -hmm. that had been um, designed by two of the um, members of the Oxford network, by Alex Vukovic and, and Sophie Moore, with breakout rooms and so forth. So. Um, already that format was very characteristic of the summer of 2020. And then Marella and I ended up having endless conversations on Zoom in the aftermath as we started putting together the volume. You know, I don't know how many hours we logged. We could probably find a record of it somewhere. But this whole thing was, uh, you know, a, a virtual conversation that first became uh, um, real, uh, first took place in real life when... Morella and I met in Venice at the International Congress of Byzantine Science, which is the first time that we'd met each other in person. And then we presented um, a piece of what became our introduction to the volume in a round table there. Um, so it's been a really exciting collaboration. And for me, it was something totally new to have a scholarly collaboration that was entirely carried out over uh, Zoom until a relatively uh, late stage of the process. Now, so if you had recorded those Zoom sessions and transcribed them, you could have published them as a book like uh, Hamilakis and Greenwood did, which was an excellent book, by the way, on archaeology and race, yeah. uh, which, which I read before the summer. Um, but okay, it, no, instead, you asked us all to contribute, which, you know, is a, is a good result in its own way. Um, and I wanted to uh, pick out the, you know, what Mirada said about there's a, a moment to reflect. And I think that your volume does this and your introduction in particular does this very well with regard to the topics that you mentioned. Um, just yesterday, I was reading an essay from the 90s by a prominent Byzantinist, relatively conservative on just, it was like for a general pop public, like what is Byzantinism? And I was struck by this um, characterization there that, well, the Byzantines didn't see race. They had no racial awareness. There's no color in how they perceived people and so forth. Like this is kind of well known. And so I like that your introduction, you know, laid out some evidence there that should cause us to think you know, twice about that, but also the question about who owns this past. Like you mentioned this, that the politicization come, becomes very real and direct there. And a lot of Byzantinists may like to think that they study something so obscure and esoteric that it can't possibly have any political relevance, but then suddenly it does. So yes, I'm very glad that the volume does this. Um, so there's one other theoretical issue I wanted to, I wanted you to, to talk about, 
which is that in the volume, Byzantine studies as a discipline appears as both a kind of colonizer in a way that is a perpetrator of colonial attitude, but also a victim of them, like subject to them in some ways. And that there's this kind of dialectic between these two things, and it's not a paradox or contradiction for a field to be trapped in, in these ways. Could you talk a little bit about that dynamic and give some examples of how the field is both pushing and being pushed by attitudes that should, again, cause us to stop and think? Um, yeah, ben, you want to give some examples of that or talk about the issue? Sure. I think this is a, a key argument that Morella and I developed in the course of those conversations. And it's that both the discipline of Byzantine studies and the historical state of Byzantium were simultaneously colonizer and colonized. And for us, this is pretty distinctive. We could probably try and think of some other examples of um, states and fields that are devoted to their study that are similarly ambivalent, but I think Byzantine studies is a particularly robust example of this ambivalence. Most disciplines would probably fall more on one or more on the other side mm. in the same way that most states would probably fall more on one, more on the other uh, side. So in terms of the state, it's a relatively obvious argument. There's times like in the sixth century when Justinian is sending out armies to conquer North Africa when the Roman state is functioning in a robustly colonialist fashion. There's also times like especially after 1204 when um, the Roman state and its elites are directly colonized by Frankish powers. This, you know, in Crete, this goes into the, the 16th century with the Venetian colonization mm -hmm. of Crete. So that's the state as both colonizer and colonized. Um, the discipline as both colonizer and colonized uh, is, is similarly ambivalent. And I think it is tied, although not in a, a neat way, to that earlier ambivalence of the state. Um, Byzantine studies is often called on to um, generate a kind of anti-Muslim narrative within histories of mm -hmm. Europe. And I think this is when Byzantine studies is probably behaving most obviously in a robustly colonialist fashion when it's serving a kind of a justificatory missionizing um, doctrine that is ultimately um, European colonialism in Muslim states in Asia and in Africa um, in the 19th century. So this would be a really robust example of Byzantine studies behaving in the way that at the same time, say, Oriental studies, Near Eastern studies, however it gets configured, is also behaving as an explicitly um, colonialist discipline. But there's not, um, how do I want to say this? Um, if we look to the other side, that would be the relationship between Byzantine studies and Oriental studies or Islamic studies. Uh, on the other side, you have the relationship between Byzantine studies and classics. And this is where we can see Byzantine studies as um, colonized in the mm. sense in which it, this is metaphorical, but it's a pretty um, strict analogy, yes, yes. extractivist colonial rule. Yeah. If you're a classicist who's going into Byzantine manuscripts and syllages and so forth and picking out, extracting the things that are useful in order for um, the study of classics and ignoring the sort of indigenous context of these kinds of artifacts that happens in archaeology, Anthony, as you were describing, it also obviously happens in textual scholarship. So that would be the most obvious example in terms of the set of attitudes that have colonized Byzantine studies. So Ben, I was intrigued by your mention of like actual Byzantine wars um, as forming part, as being in the background, albeit the deep background um, of the problems that we're facing. And we have to remember that at times, what we call Byzantium was an empire or acted like one um, insofar as its authorities um, maintained, you know, relations of inequality and subjugation between the, the 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 ruling um either elites or the metropole and various conquered populations um along either ethnic lines or you know linguistic or sometimes religious is that a kind of matrix that produces in the long run uh sort of colonialist relations within our discipline like is there a long arm of byzantine imperialism that we reproduce because 
in many fields, especially those that deal with more recent empires, that's very clear to see. Like the the ideology and the discourse of the modern empire is just re replicated in scholarship, often just verbatim. Are we facing those kinds of issues? Yeah, I think this is a really important question, actually. And we've got a couple of different ways of tackling it in the book. Um, one uh, one way of tackling it, an essay by Nick Matheu in in the in the volume, makes this point that one of the consequences of Byzantine studies is actually an is actually a really strange discipline because it exists so long as a state exists. Like we are a state based discipline. We're not like historians of mm. Anatolia. We're not like historians of like you know the British Isles from this period to this period. We're historians of one empire so long as it exists and and the consequence of this at least in in, in Nick Matthew's words is that it's produced a a, a common sense in the scholarship that's uh, that's methodologically imperialist we are or well scholars are uh, one is and um, in general um aligned with the empire sympathetic to its existence and often um more justified in the pursuit of their scholarship if the empire is more successful and less justified in the pursuit of their scholarship if the empire is a rump state and insignificant. The more significant the empire, obviously, the more valuable our work. And so it produces this, this, this relationship where we celebrate the survival of this empire, which, as you say, um, created and fostered relations of subjugation. And we Often, you know, you, you see in these slightly more traditional military histories or um, diplomatic histories, you know, we celebrate um, policies that were successful in, say, preserving the eastern frontier. And um, even if those policies meant things like, you know, moving 15,000 Armenians to the Balkans and, um, you know, an experience, a sort of a lived experience of, of, of deportation, of, of, of making kind of refugees, um, which must have been horrific for the, all those involved. Um, becomes a um, a, a laudatory like imperial policy to protect the border, and and so you know Nick says we've there's been this slippage of of, of empathy uh, uh, in in a lot of the scholarship uh, about about the Byzantine Empire in particular where we've come to associate ourselves with the Byzantine state, and I think that's made additionally difficult by the fact that a lot of our sources uh, a, a lot a lot of our sources are for the Byzantine Empire are produced at court and are written from that worldview right and so it's it's easy to slip into um uh, uh identifying with with them in a way um so so i think that's one of the kind of long arms and um, definitely and i think that's that's it that it's most abstract i think in more concrete ways it's manifested itself in um you know marginalization of um the study of the of these border peoples, Armenians, Slavs, um, on the sort of East and West. And then um, relatedly, the, the sort of downgrading of their histories to national histories and Byzantine studies um, to a kind of uh, a significant imperial history. Um, so, so you have the marginalization or kind of parochialization of these, uh, of these academic schools uh, who are seen as uh, kind of less significant border peoples, nationalist mm. historiographies, um, from the perspective of the, the empire, this kind of starting point being Constantinople. And so I think that's a sort of, I guess, a long arm that you have to critically examine if, if you have a discipline that is based on the existence of, a, of an imperial state. Um, and I think maybe, again, we're at different stages of our self-critique, I think, the sort of ancient Roman Empire, this has been kind of challenged a lot more proactively, and um, it's been kind of thought about a bit more than 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 with the Byzantine and um, with the Byzantine Empire. But I think in part that's because Byzantine scholars are so often like defending their place at the table that they might slip into sort of celebrating how important and therefore gigantic the empire was to to make a case for for their presence. Yeah. So sort of slipping into that celebration. Yeah, there might be some more resistance to that kind of analysis or critique on the Byzantine side because it's both its religion and as a state entity, it, it more closely related to modern ones that have a vested interest, unlike the Roman Empire, which, okay, uh, but we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, I, there, there are, I, I think it's, again, like a fractal relationship. In other words, the the kind of um, subordinate status that Byzantine studies has in relation to classics or the study of the ancient Roman Empire, where it's kind of lesser and 
often absent or marginalized, is reproduced fractally within Byzantine studies between the center, a kind of you know Roman Greek Orthodox elite perspective, and the peripheries, which are often treated as auxiliary and supplementary and sometimes you know ignored and so forth. Um, so there is a sense in which we have these hierarchies of of, of value, investment, and expertise um, in the field. And I, like I, for one, would would like the the kind of stranglehold that Greek philology exercises um, on the field to really be loosened so that other languages can be brought into the discussion. Um, in, in the sense that, I mean, Byzantine is a made up term, but Byzantine literature simply cannot mean Greek medieval literature. Like it, that can't continue to hold. Uh, but anyway, there's different podcasts about that. Um, so the flip side of this is that the Western scholarship on Byzantium has constructed a Byzantium that's very suitable to European ideological needs and has kind of made the Byzantium that it wants and has made it kind of subordinate to Western narratives um, and a kind of Western order of things. And I particularly like the phrase, which I got double underlined in your introduction, which was to, to your call to combat the fictionalization of Byzantium as an extra historical entity. Could you give some examples of how this plays out in practice? Uh, ben, you want to start? Sure. Um, that phrase is something that we came up with in dialogue with Geraldine Heng's work. Um, Geraldine Heng is a, a scholar of medieval English literature um, uh, who wrote a book called The Invention of Race in the Middle Ages, in which um, she calls for the uh, an end to the abstraction of medieval violence as not being significant because it happens in some sort of a fantasy space. And, and there's lots of these fantasy spaces that uh, occupy Byzantium, that position Byzantium as significant. Anthony, as you're saying, very often in relation to a specific Eurocentric kind of a narrative um, that is totally abstracted from any of the realities of uh, Byzantine history. A really good example of this would be, I think, um, French absolutist investment, ideological investment in Byzantine ceremonial, more generally in Byzantine um, government as being a model for a strong Christian theocratic uh, state that also the Prussian uh, monarchy in the 19th century um, turns to Byzantium and constructs Byzantium as a model for uh, an absolutist monarchy in the present day. Those are both you know, fictionalizations of Byzantium that pull it out of its historical realities and uh, make it into a resource for a contemporary political agenda. And I think you see this also, Adam Goldwyn, who's a Byzantinist uh, scholar of literature, has uh, written some really interesting work about the way that Byzantium figures in the sort of paranoid historical imaginary of men's rights activists or of uh, white supremacists on online platforms today. That again, there's this notion of Byzantium as being this kind of um, fantasy space, this um, essentially theocratic absolutist state. It's a very similar construction actually to the one that you find um, in French imperial thought in the 17th century or in Prussian imperial thought in the 19th century. So I think that's the most persistent example of this fictionalization is the construction of Byzantium as the uh, theocracy, uh, strong absolutist state, uh, anti-Muslim, in fact, Europe's mm -hmm. bulwark against the Islamic world you know, that has a very long history as a figure of thought in the West, and it has very little to do with the realities of mm -hmm. Byzantine history as as we know them as scholars of Byzantine history. Yeah, Mirella, something you want to add? Um, yeah, and I, I think one of the like key there's it, because Byzantium is kind of can be fictionalized to to many different ends. One of the one of the ways in which this fictionalization, I think, manifests in particular when trying to other Byzantium. So what you what you touched on, Anthony, here, this kind of Western European uh, sort of encoded biases of sort of what is normal, what is what civilization is, what is pro what what progress in, in in the sort of history of civilization looks like. 
And there's been a really interesting fictionalization of the sort of Byzantine church and state, the relationship between church and state and Byzantium. Um, as the West in particular kind of starts, especially in the late 19th century, um, to see the birth of Western Europe as the kind of separation of church and state and become obsessed with the sort of scholastics of the sort of 13th century who theorize regicide against a tyrant or says, you know, the separation of why the church can't do this and et cetera. And you have this separation of these of these systems. Byzantium becomes the opposite, becomes this alternative universe where this didn't happen. And this in turn explains why uh, uh, it fell to the Ottomans, Islam, another religion that doesn't separate church and state, and why it never, you know, went through the Renaissance, or why it is that the kind of Eastern uh, Eastern Europe is still is still so backwards. So, so this kind of fictionalization is oftentimes is, is kind of um, uh, totally creative, but sometimes it's you know it's that kind of Levi, Levi Straussian opposite. It's just whatever the antithesis of the thing that we're looking for in um, uh, in Western in, in Western norms. Yeah, one question that I ask myself that kind of ties a lot of these things together is whenever I come across an image of Byzantium that I beginning to suspect is a little fictionalized, and is there behind it the question, what have you done for us? Right. And so, for example, the idea that, well, Byzantium was important because it prevented Europe from being conquered by the Muslims. It's like, yeah, this is not why any, anyone in Constantinople was doing anything. This is what it might look like, you know, from France. And the startling thing is that the earliest attestation of that view that I have found is 12th century. Hmm. Peter the Venerable. He's a whole paragraph about this is the function, and he's praising Ioannis Komnenos, the emperor in Constantinople. This is the function that you perform. And like, wow. That like has really, really deep roots. Um, anyways, yeah, what have you done for us? Like, oh, you preserved the classical Greek texts. We'll take those now. Thank you very much. <laughs> you clearly didn't understand them, but thank you for, for keeping them. Um, so there is a lot of this going on. And 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 you're right. I mean, online you find, I mean, all kinds of crazy constructions and, you know, that, that are all meant to promote some current ideology, whatever. So specific subsection of, of these kinds of notions um, goes under the term Orientalism. So there is now there is by now a flourishing bibliography on Byzantine studies as a kind of subspecies of Orientalism. This is a very big topic. We can actually do a separate discussion on this, but because some uh, in members of the audience might be interested, like, well, how, how does this pan out? Could you give some examples of what that means in our field and you know where we might see Orientalism in practice in Byzantine studies? You know, Morella and I were just discussing this a couple of days ago, and um, it's something that we addressed very briefly in the introduction, because one of the uh, objections to our question, our central question, is Byzantine studies a colonialist discipline, was actually there's two main objections that we heard sort of in the immediate aftermath of that call. The first was, why are you talking about colonialism? And everybody knows that nationalism is the problem with Byzantine studies, and I expect we may get to that as well. The other objection was um, Byzantine studies can't possibly be colonialist because Byzantium has been so thoroughly orientalized and othered by uh, Eurocentric discourse. And we've already discussed various examples of this uh, this afternoon in our conversation. I think that um, it's very important to distinguish between Orientalism and Byzantine studies um, in the same way in which Morella was pointing this out. Um, the uh, Balkanism is a very distinct phenomenon from Orientalism. It constructs mm -hmm. an other to Europe, but it constructs that other very differently on mm -hmm. different grounds. Um, and similarly, I think Orientalism, for that to really have analytical force, has to be ultimately about um, both religious and linguistic difference. Uh, religious difference as either Islam or Judaism, as opposed to uh, Christianity. And uh, linguistic difference largely as Semitic as opposed to Indo-European languages, this concept in comparative historical grammar, that there's a fundamental difference between Arabic or Akkadian or Hebrew, and on the one hand, and, and Greek 
or Latin on the other hand. And so those constructions of a, a difference are much more stark when applied to Islamic studies or um, uh, Semitic philology than they are when applied to Byzantine studies. Byzantium is closer because Byzantium is Christian, although not exactly the right kind of Christian, nevertheless Christian. Um, and it's also different because it is Greek, although, Anthony, as you were saying, this is something that we could really contest on the basis of our knowledge of Byzantine literature as a polyglot literature. Nevertheless, it's usually constructed as a kind of subset of classics as basically part of the history of the Greek language. So there are certainly moments in, you know, there's famous examples that all Byzantinists know of plays. So this play by Victorien Sardou from the early 20th century about Theodora that takes a lot of Orientalist tropes that had been highly developed by that point in European culture and applies them to Byzantium. And we see this especially in the area of gender and the way that Byzantine gender is represented in modern European cultural production, um, the sort of the, the feminized um, Byzantine man being a key figure. Leonora Neville has written a lot about this in her work. Um, but I think that that's a kind of a secondary phenomenon. That's the, the porting over of something from Orientalist discourse onto Byzantium. I don't think it's fundamental to the way that Byzantium and Byzantine studies are constructed in Western Europe. Um, they are also othered, but the phenomenon is distinct in really interesting ways that we should try to preserve when we're discussing the relationship between Byzantium and Orientalism. Yeah, I would agree that there is a distinction that we need to maintain um, and that sometimes Orientalist tropes bleed into Byzantine studies or the representation of Byzantium in, in Western media. Um, but there's a, I don't know, I don't know if I want to push back against that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking sort of furiously now, but there's a sense in which Orientalism is is a way of constructing a culture in order to facilitate its domination by Western representations or or political and economic interests. Mm -hmm. And I see this happening consistently um, that Byzantium is represented in a way that makes it deficient by the yardsticks of you know Western hegemony, and that it needs, you know, like you find this in crusading scholarship still. Now you might argue that that's kind of marginal to the field and yes, that it is, but you you do find it like, ah, Byzantium was falling apart by the late 12th century and they really needed these virile Western knights to come in and put some order, you know, and restore true leader. You, you see this being written today. Um, anyway. Um, I think that's really interesting. I think part of the difference for me, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think one of the, one of the, the distinctions that maybe it's worth throwing in here is that, you have um, you have this book imagining the Balkans, which argues you know the Balkans are not orientalized; they're Balkanized. It's, it's mm. slightly different. Balkan men are not effeminized; they're actually seen as kind of a, a mas masculine, hypermasculine, and savage in a very different way. Um, so you have Balkanism, mm. which I think is uh, uh, defensible as what's going on in in Western portrayals of the Balkans, and you have Orientalism, which is which is is what's happening in portrayal of uh, of the near east in 19th century painting literature and you know political discourse and and byzantium underpins both of these but as a kind of absence right it's, it's such a huge part of orientalism that it's about how we portray the savages that are there now and balkanism is another is another one of these and i think to, to that degree i mean byzantium is the sort of the ground upon which both both emerge and mm. um, uh, you know these are territories that the Byzantine Empire held they've produced two really different discourses when it comes to the 19th century people that occupy them and um, uh, uh, on the one hand the Muslims and on the other um, you know Slavs and, 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 and Albanians and Greeks in the Balkans and um, and I think Byzantium is kind of key to both of these discourses but I think the fact that both emerge from its kind of territories shows just how much diversity there is in the in the way that Byzantine legacies end up being refracted, right? And mm. um, how much you want to stress Byzantine continuity in, say, the Ottoman Empire, which was prime subject of orientalization, yeah. versus how much um, various nationalist kingdoms want to stress continuity with Byzantium as they're being balkanized. And um, so I think it is all there, but I think it's not it's not just the one. I think it is this kind of multiplicity. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I think Ben is right that when it comes to othering civilizations, Byzantium hasn't been othered quite in the same way that, you know, Europe's other great, like, for example, the world of Islam or, um, you know, native societies in Americas or Australia, like those were othered in different ways in order to highlight and sharpen, um, you know, what makes Europe special. The the peculiarity of Byzantium is that, and, and this is kind of a thesis that I've been thinking about, um, and I'm, I'm developing a separate uh, project, which is that it's kind of like this this inside resource of cultural, um, you know, traits and everything from, you know, religion, the origins of Christianity and doctrine and, you know, the New Testament uh, to uh, Roman law and, you know, the Greek classics and Greek language. So it's this incredibly valuable resource that Western Europeans want to draw from, but distance themselves from. So it becomes like the negative version of all the things that Europe prides itself about. Um, and it's how those three traditions go bad. So it's not like completely outside. It's just the, it's the negative mirror of what Europe aspires to be. It's despotic or superstitious or doesn't understand the classics. Like that's what Gibbon is, you know, like largely doing. Um, and I, I just think that's a fascinating, and, and in some ways, it's a more subtle process than just completely, you know, othering. Uh, anyway. All right. I, I, that, I won't digress more about that. But Ben, you mentioned nationalism. Can you tell, so what were the objections? Like, why is nationalism an objection to the, your conceptualization here of a colonialist discipline? What, what's the problem with nationalism? I think when nationalism is discussed in the context of Byzantine studies, it's often a complaint by North American or West European scholars about Byzantine studies as it's practiced in uh, Eastern Europe. So there's a notion that there is um, nationalist scholarship exists. It's a problem. Um, it is fundamental to certain biases in the field. It stands in the way of objective scholarship and where it exists is very localized. It does not exist in Belgium or in the United States. It exists in Macedonia. Mm. It exists in Serbia. So it, and this concept is very similar to um, one that was explored by the subaltern studies school of historians writing in the 80s, and in particular, um, Partha Chatterjee, who writes this famous book called um, Colonialism and Nationalism as a Derivative Discourse. Um, a derivative, namely, of um, uh, colonialist ideologies, but he begins by pointing out the ways in which nationalism is discussed as a good thing when it's part of the history of England or of France, the formation of the nation and the strong national identity is part of a progress towards a bourgeois democracy and it's set within a, a specific narrative of a political development, but it's a bad thing when it appears in the colonies. It's a bad thing when it appears in the East. These are two kinds of nationalism. So one of the proposals that we want to make in this volume is to think about, first of all, how nationalism is something that inflects everybody who is working as a scholar within a particular nationalist context, regardless of whether that's in the United States um, or in Russia or in Turkey or what the nation is in particular that we're speaking about. We're all dealing with some form of nationalism in our domestic context. And very frequently that nationalism does manifest as a kind of a, a byproduct or an after effect of our period of colonialism, that the ideologies that are operative in um, many varieties of nationalism are similarly exclusionary um, to those that were developed in the context of colonial rule. This is the key argument for Chatterjee is how it's very difficult. Post-colonialism does not necessarily become anti-colonialism in the period of the nation. It can as easily be a period of essentially um, uh, latter-day um, colonialism um, continuing within the national context. And if you take that way of conceptualizing the sort of colonialist nationalist divide that was developed in the subaltern studies school and apply it to Byzantine studies, 
more broadly, we could say also to Hellenic studies, a lot of that work has been done specifically by Yanis Samalakis in terms of thinking through the implications of that subaltern studies school for thinking about modern Greek history. And I think it works equally well if we try and bring it back and use it as a way to think about the study of um, Byzantine history. So hopefully that helps to kind of reframe this objection. It's not that we shouldn't be talking about the ways in which nationalism is manifested within Byzantine studies. It clearly is manifested within Byzantine studies, but there's two challenges there. And one is not to sequester it to a particular set of nations. When there are basically subjective nations that are doing bad nationalist scholarship and objective nations that are doing non-nationalist um, scholarship. But it also should challenge us to think, um, and this is one of the key challenges and provocations that Morella's uh, Oxford Network made in the summer of 2020, to think about um, ways of conceiving Byzantine studies that are not explicitly based on nations. Um, I don't know, Morella, if it, would you like to say a little bit about that call that the network put out? Yeah. So yeah. So in the sort of in the midst of this, um, the Hagia Sophia. Um, fiasco and um, when a series of, of, of open letters came to, to flying out from various national committees one of the things that really struck us is just how and um, limiting the way in which Byzantine studies is organized internationally is which is that we have an international association of Byzantine studies um, which has uh, national member states um, and, and they have national committees and these committees are and we tried to, to sort of inquire into how these committees are formed and what the practices of electing these committees are. And it's and it's completely untransparent. So you have a very small committee in one country that is self-appointed and uh, impossible to like enter. You have other committees that are democratically elected, you know, and have compulsory younger members and have various whatever. Yeah. And so you have this, this inequality and you also have um, within that, you, you have these kinds of chains of, you know, you have the Orthodox Alliance and you have the whatever, you know, so, so you have these and, 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 and what really struck us is that the kind of the people who are most likely to be critiquing Eastern nationalism are often kind of in charge of this organization. Their network of, of national committees is powerful enough that they tend to sway which way the Congress is going to go. And they tend to have kind of quite a loud say in the, in, in the, um, uh, in the organization and one of the things that we became interested in is well what is it what is, if we if we do want to critique nationalism if that's what we really want to do then why do we denationalize the, the the Byzantine association can we just have individual membership open you know uh, congress meetings and so on and so forth and as you can imagine this encountered some resistance I mean there was a lot of and and the resistance that was given to us was there was a lot of goodwill we had a few meetings and a lot of interest, but basically they said, well, you can't make the national committees do anything. And I, and I thought that was a sort of brilliant uh, uh, conclusion to, to, to this journey, that it's like, oh, actually nationalism is a problem, but it's a problem everywhere. <laughs> you can't make any of them do anything. Um, and you certainly can't make a nation give up its autonomous voting right as a nation. Um, mm. and, and, and so I thought, I thought that was a kind of like an interesting, an interesting case study in how far this seeps um, the seeps in where, where even the sort of more liberal anti-nationalist committees are like, well, we can't lose our vote as a national committee. Um, uh, but 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 I think again, it's it, it's a nice example of the it's a it's an interesting playing field, right? Because you have the Albanian National Committee, which is say very small, but Albania oversees a lot of Byzantine um, remains, right? It's really important Byzantine cities, and we will never have a congress or a conference or whatever in 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 Albania. Meanwhile, the next congress will be in Vienna, which has no Byzantine remains. <laughs> um, and so, is there a way forward that is about collaborating? Why can't the Vienna, you know, decolonization as a kind of not a metaphor? Why can't Vienna? organize a conference in duress right there is a way there's a sort of way beyond the nation here but i don't but it's but it's not permitted by the infrastructure that's in place and um, and that's not eastern infrastructure is it that was very well put and i just have to say for the record that i have never been um motivated to get involved in any of these national committees i i never from the very beginning understood why the field is organized this way it made no sense I have from the beginning understood modern national identities and ideologies to be kind of antagonistic to the purpose of scholarship and the way I wanted to practice scholarship. And nevertheless, 
our institutions are nationally defined. A, a lot of the research institutes and so the funding and so forth are all linked to national government priorities. And there are these incredible mismatches. Just exactly as you said, you have countries with a lot of resources like the United States and you know powerful you know, universities and large committees, but have in a, operating in a country that has, I think, zero investment in Byzantium. And then countries like Turkey, which have like in their just simply in their territory and history, enormous investment in the Byzantine past, but have the 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 national climate is not entirely friendly to the operation of the committees. And it it's just so bizarre. And then you have these small countries that it anyway, you're right. I, I just never understood that. Um I mean, I can understand historically how that might come to be. But it, it doesn't seem to make any sense. <laughs> um, and and Ben, you're you're right. This isn't like a case where, um, you know, Greeks and Serbs have nationalism, but you know, British and American scholars don't. The 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 weird thing is that I find myself categorized in very strange ways for precisely this reason. And I mean, I am in my mind, I am a generic American cultural historian, <laughs> but I am very often classified as a Greek national historian. Like I'm sort of wrestling through my national, which I never had a national upbringing at all. My mother's American. And and yet it's so strange to find myself classified that way by like British and American scholars. Mm -hmm. like why are you nationalizing me now for no particular reason? Anyway, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Right. Well, okay. We, we could talk a lot about nationalism and Byzantine. <laughs> um, okay. So last question, let's wrap this up. Um, could you propose some steps or does, in the book, do you propose some steps by which to decolonize Byzantine studies? These could either be very concrete things or they can be very abstract theoretical issues that we need to work with. But I'd like to end the episode with you mentioning a few of these. We've had a lot of fun really thinking about the various ways that you could decolonize to the call to decolonize in the summer of 2020 was was quite general and it included within it in the same way that we were saying at the start of this podcast that uh, we can understand disciplines as being colonialist in very different ways and there's a similar spectrum in terms of what it means to decolonize a discipline and um, it's a very famous much cited essay by uh, Tuck and Wang that insists that uh, decolonization is not a metaphor. And what they mean by that quite concretely um, is that decolonization means giving land back to the people from whom it was stolen. And if there is no land back, um, then this is not colonization. I mean, both of those scholars have sort of pulled back a little bit from that extreme position. And more recent um, interviews, they've both you know, acknowledge the real importance of colonialism at the cultural level and not just at the level of land ownership. Uh, but nevertheless, it is interesting to think what a land back claim would look like in terms of you know, Byzantine studies. You know, concretely, that's going to be very different depending on where you sit. That kind of indigenous critique of settler colonialism is necessarily place-based, right? So I'm at Cornell University on the ancestral homelands of the Gai Gahono nation. And um, that puts me in a very different set of relationships than if I were in Chicago or Sheffield or anywhere else on the globe. And there aren't a lot of Byzantine studies institutions in the United States that own land, right? Mm -hmm. But the obvious uh, target here would be Dumbarton Oaks. So a full non-metaphorical decolonization of Byzantine studies in the United States um, might mean Dumbarton Oaks giving back land um, in Georgetown to those indigenous nations from whom it was taken in the process of the colonization of the Americas. Um, but we can also you know, imagine um, a slightly more metaphorical but still meaningful form of decolonization of institutions like that. Um, people who have visited Dumbarton Oaks are probably familiar with these private security um, details that patrol the streets outside the museum and the research center and the library 
And that's an institution that has a very antagonistic relationship to the very affluent neighborhood of Washington, D.C., within which it exists. Um, so you know, more metaphorically decolonized Dumbarton Oaks would be a Dumbarton Oaks that's more open to the community around it and is more involved in engaging other community museums in Washington, D.C., like the Anacostia Museum and joint programming. So that would be more metaphorical, but nevertheless, um, I think quite meaningful as a, a, a gesture of goodwill, um, even if it's not strictly speaking land back decolonization. And, but that's a really explicitly uh, American uh, context. I mean, right. that discourse, American, Australian, the various sort of um, you know, basically British settler colonial states around the world yeah. um, have a very specific set of associations with um, decolonization that are going to look different if you're sitting um, in a different part of the world. Yes, I. you're right. I once uh, witnessed a, a colleague who was... Uh, working through those same questions, but from a Balkan standpoint, and could not find an answer that didn't result in a war. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this, I mean, at the sort of at the heart of this problem for the Balkans, of course, is that there is, you know, it's it's quite difficult to find who the indigenous Byzantines are that we need to be giving this land to. And me and Ben have had sort of long, hour long conversations about being like, are they the Fanariots of the 19th century? <laughs> Should we give them some land? Are they, you know, who who are they? Where can we find the Byzantines um, uh, to, to give land back to? Um, but obviously the, the, you know, I mean, the, the, the question sort of manifests itself really differently once you, yeah, once you take it over. And I think when, when we look at Europe, Another very productive way to to to, to think about resources is, is kind of what I was talking about earlier. I mean, you have this huge something that you touched upon as well at the start of the podcast, Anthony. You you have a lot of wealth in uh, British or American institutions um, invested in excavations in in these countries, creating these pseudo colonial relationships, and you have um, these Byzantine congresses that are kind of uh, uh, being circulated around. There are ways in which we can, you know, think about wealth redistribution, um, which does not produce this kind of uh, the kind of colon colonial relationship that you describe in in archaeological sites, where a foreign expert comes with money and wealth and hires kind of unskilled local labour. So, so it would be one thing would be thinking about these kinds of collaborations. Can we organise the international congress? between Albania and Vienna, or can we uh, organize these um, excavations in, in less colonialist ways? There's a, a few other examples in our volume that are kind of m even more specific. Um, we have an article actually by the curator of um, Dumbarton Oaks collection, um, and also by um, a curator of the Byzantine collection at the Met, so two of the, the biggest kind of uh, collections of Byzantine artifacts in, in North America. Um, and both of them talk about what it means to tell a story about Byzantium that isn't Hellenocentric and Orthodox centric. And so they give examples of, um, um, in, the, in the case of the Met, Andrea actually talks about Byzantium in Africa, which is obviously a huge exhibition coming up in the Met um, this November. Um, but what does it mean to integrate Africa into, into stories of this kind of Eastern Mediterranean world and thus decenter its Greekness? Um, and, and Betsy Williams from Dumbarton Oaks talks also about uh, well, what about the kind of other other cultures of um, uh, of late antiquity? What do we do with Persianite objects in Byzantine collections? We don't tend to display them actually, and um, because they're not telling this, this, the same the sort of appropriate story. And mm -hmm. um, so there's ways in which we can, again, slightly more metaphorically, um, look upon the kind of uh, the the institutions that are the custodians of this heritage and think about the story that's being that's being told. And then so that's institutional and got kind of global you know, wealth redistribution, we've got institutional narratives. And then individually, there's a few examples um, uh, from the volume one by Matthew Kinlock, which is to think about our citation practices. I mean, one of the main ways in which kind of um, scholarly norms are reproduced in ways that are unthinking is that we are all trained with the sort of uh, the generation above. And then when we write our books, we do our bits of original scholarship and when it gets to the bit where you sort of write the framing or the big picture or what's going on broadly in the century, um, you you quickly slip into um, referencing familiar textbooks. And, and, and what that tends to reproduce is an, an, an overwhelmingly uh, uh, sort of white and interconnected world of, of, of 
of old men, basically. And, and thinking kind of proactively about why is it that we cite who we cite and, and this one particular distinction, which actually comes from, from classics and in, in, in internal and external citation, do we only cite within our discipline? Or do you cite people who are outside of our discipline? And, and these are these are kind of practices which which would produce these norms, these, these hegemonic norms that can be kind of um, critiqued in our own um, in our own day to day work, right? Um, so that would be a sort of more um, in individual um, example. The, the final thing I'd say is Hugh Jeffrey has a brilliant essay about how we teach Byzantine archaeology in particular, um, and and this kind of is the big point of our volume really that within the first step to decolonizing any discipline is writing a critical historiography of it. Where does your discipline come from and what are its problems? What are its prejudices? What are, what, where does its money come from? And we've not tended to do this kind of scholarship in Byzantine studies. A lot of the summaries of Byzantine history tend to be, oh, and then this person developed social history and then this person who's a student went on to do yeah. this thing. And um, so if we take a step back and we do a structural critical um, history and, and it's the same, and Hugh Jeffrey's example is about archeology. span You can't study Byzantine archeology span without studying the 20th century you can't just study the fifth century that's not possible because you turn up to a site that's got a landscape that was produced by 20th century politics history colonial relations between these states and and and, and the funding and so on and so forth so so that's the sort of uh, foundation i guess the first step yeah. or, or wars um it's it's remarkable sometimes when you're working through some you know material evidence or an archaeological site and it appears to be just like knowledge that just kind of fell from the sky and 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 you dig into like where this came from it's like oh no this is when i don't know the russians were occupying some part of the ottoman empire for a few years or the greeks the invasion of you know asia minor or when and they dug and dug and dug and dug and then they published this like a, here is knowledge yeah. anyway um yeah, yeah okay so there are many more um, avenues of, uh, you know, critique, but also of the way the field can move forward with these questions in the books. I recommend anyone who has made it this far is clearly interested in the question. So go, go read the book. Um, the chapters are relatively short and concise. Uh, ben and Mirada, thank you so much for putting this together. For one thing, it's, it's a really rare kind of project for our field, which, you know, has tended to be rather hagiographic to the degree that it was introspective. Um, and also for appearing on the podcast. So thank you both for coming on. Thank you, Anthony. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having us, Anthony.